Hello and welcome to today's workshop, EDUP Exchange, the second session in a three-part series setting up for AWP success. So before we begin, just a reminder of who we are at O3. We're a modern-based uh, platform that leverages advanced work packaging and agile best practices to disrupt the status quo for companies in industrial construction who want to improve productivity, safety, quality, and predictability. So just a quick safety moment. Um, this is on the importance of preventative care. Um, and as some of you may have heard in the news, the, the biggest thing that has kind of coincided with the pandemic is that a lot of people have stopped going to their regular appointments for other types of screenings, um, such as cancers and uh, diabetes, blood pressure, any, any of those other types of health concerns have kind of declined in terms of getting checked. Um, and I think that's just because people were afraid to go to the doctor and just kind of stayed at home, but we have to remember, you still have to take care of yourself. So here's some helpful tips. It's uh, just to make sure you continue to go to your regular annual visits to your doctor, uh, especially for your kids, well child visits, well baby visits. Um, and just to get your routine vaccinations against uh, just the regular diseases like measles, polio, meningitis. Um, and then, you know, to continue your counseling appointments too. Um, and to get screened for things like uh, cervical cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. Um, and of course, you should get your vaccine for COVID and flu. Um, and that helps prevent a lot of other uh uh, sickness. So just a great reminder to not forget to continue to go to your doctor. Okay, so today's agenda uh, for setting up for AWP success. First, we're just going to give a quick background on AWP and what this series is about. And then we'll review the need for an implementation toolkit and the available materials that we have for you. And then we'll review the plan for the actual toolkit, uh, part two. And then we'll have our interactive session. Um, and there will be a mural link that you will join. And you will get to actually participate and provide feedback and ideas. Um, and it'll help brainstorm. And then we will vote at the end on some of those ideas that you present and contribute. Um, and then lastly, we'll. Uh, We'll preview our next session. And then if we have time, we'll have some questions that we can answer. And if you have a question throughout, just a reminder to submit those in the GoToWebinar chat over there in the panel of your screen. And you'll receive a copy of today's slides and a recording of the presentation in a few days. So with that, I'll introduce our speaker. Once again, it's Andrew Foy. He is O3 Solutions Director of AWP and Construction Excellence. Um, he <clears throat> has 16 years of industrial construction experience with an extensive AWP background, and he served on many boards and committees. With that, I'll let you take over, Andrew. Welcome, and thank you again for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you, Terry. Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to say a quick hello with the camera on, and I'll do you all the benefit of turning the camera off so we can focus on the material rather than my face. And so um, what we're going to be looking at today, as Terry mentioned, is the second in a three-part series of workshops supporting the AWP Implementation Toolkit. So firstly, a little bit of background. CII was made an AWP best practice in 2015, and since then, various subcommittees and working groups within CII are steadily developing more material to support AWP implementation and usage. But what we're seeing is a lack of a single complete walkthrough for how to do AWP on a project. Essentially, there's a lot of theory, but what we're not seeing is that single coherent step by step. So, what we want to do is create that sample project that gives a consideration to technology and create a step-by-step -step guide for an actual well actual project an actual fake project and show how awp is actually implemented and pushed through with real examples real data real information so that you can follow it along and it makes more sense to the kind of work that you're doing 
So this is going to be the plan for our AWP implementation toolkit. For those of you who joined us last month, this first section is going to act as a brief reminder. And for those of you who weren't able to join our last session, this is going to outline those plans for this implementation toolkit. So we want to help companies that are starting on their AWP journey. We want to help them understand what a systematic step-by-step -step approach for AWP can look like using, as I said, a sample project. And we want to get away from the abstract. We want to get away from the theory. I've read lots and lots of pages of here's how AWP can be applied, but there's very few practical examples of here's an actual path of construction, for example. So by making this real, by using actual models, real world examples, and project specific content, we're aiming to make the deliverables relatable and easy to understand for project professionals. It's a lot, lot easier to understand something when you can grasp what the what the words are, what the, the content is, because it's something you come across every day. So why would you listen to us? Firstly, I'm gonna tell you that we have all the answers. Nobody does. And that's part of the reason why we're here today. O3 is, however, the first and only software solution dedicated to, support, to supporting AWP across all the project phases. We know what's needed to make AWP work, both from the theoretical side, from the practical side, and from the technology side. And personally, for myself, I have years of real-world experience creating and rolling out AWP programs, typically from scratch, a blank, starting with a blank piece of paper, which is where many of you probably find yourselves, and I've done that for various organizations throughout North America. So this is not new to me. If you're responsible for making AWP work for your organization, I've been in your shoes. I've sat in your chair. Um, and what we're going to do is share this experience coupled with the most advanced AWP software on the market. So then the big question, why are we giving this away for free? Yes, we could be charging for this, but we want to help the AWP community to grow and move the industry forward. The best way to do that is to spread the message to as wide an audience as possible. One of the things we want to tackle here is simplification. There's a lot of information about AWP. We'll, we'll review some of it here today. And it's easy to get flooded with detail. For any of you who've seen some of those CRI documents, you know, you sit down with a 300 page document and start at page one, wondering how long it's gonna take you to get through it all. For all of the detail that, though, in a lot of these documents, the message sometimes lacks what I always refer to as a headline. So what's the simple thing? What are we trying to do? We will build work packages. Uh, so we get very, very deep into the weeds and the details, but sometimes we lack the, the top level information. So some tools like the AWP Primer from CII try to distill AWP down to its basic components, which is a great start but we want to provide this whole toolkit in a way that doesn't scare people off and make them think they're gonna need a PhD in astrophysics to understand it. We want to make the project solutions relatable and the detail appropriate for the audience. The deliverables will be released periodically over the next year with one planned release per month. The first batch of deliverables associated with the topic we covered in the, in the webinar last month, learning about AWP, are going to be available to you at the end of this workshop and that's going to be we'll show you a link once we get to the end of the workshop where you can go and download those so then every month there'll be a new update and a new link to go and download more content okay so let's take a look at what the content is going to be for the implementation toolkit so this is the plan for what we're going to share with everybody the first phase and again for those of you who are aware, on the call last month as i say this is a recap the first phase is understanding what AWP is and how it can help your organization. You're going to need to calculate the value of AWP and make a business case for its use. If you're the nominated AWP champion for your organization, if you're the one who's been told, hey, we've heard about this AWP thing, go figure it out, then you're going to be tasked with understanding what it is and whether it makes sense for your company. Where do you begin? And this is sort of the, like I said, the sort of blank piece of paper stage. So in this, what we're referring to as the learn section, which is the one that's being published today, we're gonna to cover how to learn about AWP and wade through the mountains of information, even just where to find information uh, to really help you grasp what AWP is at a practical level. We're also gonna look at how to calculate return on investment or ROI 
by assessing the costs and benefits of AWP to ensure that it's going to bring value. And on a side note, and this is something I always try and emphasize with people, AWP isn't all about money. It's going to bring benefits for safety, quality, schedule, predictability, and a range of other things, all of which are going to help your project delivery and the people that are working with you. But the first thing most companies want to know is how much it's going to cost me and how much am I going to save? So we're going to start there. Then we're going to describe how to build your business case for implementing AWP. You're going to have to go and sit in front of your management team and say, we want to do this AWP thing. This is just a question of asking nicely. What do you need to do to get management buy-in? You know, does it need a, a six-day seminar to understand it? So we're going to show you, give you an idea and give you a structure of the kind of business case and the information that you can bring to the management group uh, to sell or sort of promote the use of AWP within your company. So those are the three deliverables that we're releasing today. And like I said, a link will be provided at the end. So the second section, once you've sold it to management, we're going to look at how to select a pilot project for implementation. So the question is, does it matter which project you choose? Uh, yeah, I'll give you a hint. It does. Uh, and in the last um, session, the last webinar last month, we covered some of the, the logic and the reasons behind choosing an AWP pilot project. So we're going to get into, in the plan section, some of the practicalities of early implementation steps, creating a procedure and the associated workflows for your company to use as your AWP manual. That, by the way, is a big beast. Um, again, especially if you're starting from scratch, you sit down with a blank piece of paper and get told, write us an AWP manual. There are colleagues of ours, consultants out there, various people in the industry that will look to come in and do it for you. Um, there's always going to be benefit in you being able to do it yourself, grow it organically and do it in such a way that's going to work well for your organization. Um, so definitely there is some value in having some expertise brought in, but this will also give you a leg up in being able to start for yourself. Um, we're going to look at things like what the differences are, depending on whether you're the owner, the EP, the CM, or the C contractor. So are you holding the purse strings? Are you the engineering contractor, the construction management, or are you the one building the work in the field? We want to give you a step-by-step paint-by-numbers guide for implementation. And we want to get rid of the idea that AWP is this giant, complicated beast, so that we can show how it can be a, I won't go as far as to say simple, but certainly a structured, systematic approach. Um, so that's going to be the deliverable that, we're, that we'll be releasing next month will be the procedure. Then we're going to tackle the big question of what you need to consider when selecting AWP technology. So the old wisdom held that you needed to spend a long time getting your AWP process nailed down before you even thought about your technology. But the O3 platform has been purpose built to support AWP from start to finish with the best practices already baked into the product. So instead of having to create this big process and then fight with a piece of technology to align it to your process or vice versa, creating a big process and then getting a piece of technology that doesn't line up and having to change the process you've just spent a year building, we're now at the point where implementing technology early will give you that solid foundation for your AWP process and implementation and can actually speed up the rate of your adoption for AWP. Okay, now we're getting into FEL2, or for those of you who don't use the FEL nomenclature, the select phase. This is where the rubber meets the road. You're in a project now. You're implementing AWP. So first up, during FEL2, we're going to show you how to create construction work areas, a path of construction, a work breakdown structure, and an AWP plan. These are going to be the building blocks of AWP, and getting these right will set you on the right path. FEL2, where it all starts, much like with project execution itself, the FEL stage is where you're going to get a project right or wrong in terms of how you set it up. And FEL2 is a critical, critical phase for making sure that you're selecting the right approach to your project, both in terms of the execution and in terms of AWP itself. And of those, the path of construction is the single most important deliverable for AWP on the project. So make sure you give it the attention it deserves. If you don't get that sorted out, ironed out, 
get the right people involved and get a good path of construction early in the project, it's going to be a fight. And in each case, we're not just going to tell you how we did it. We're going to provide a functioning copy to show you what a real one looks like and where available a template for your use. So for example, with a path of construction, we're actually going to write a path of construction for this dummy project. And we're going to give you a copy of that path of construction and a copy of a template for a path of construction so you can fill it out for yourselves. Obviously, you know, modify it to your own organization's needs, but it'll at least show you the structure, how it's laid out and what kind of things to include. So doing anything during FEL2 can seem a little daunting. Project information and design progression is at a minimum. You don't have a lot of data. But this is also the very reason why it's the perfect time to start. Your construction decisions are going to have the best chance of having a meaningful impact on the project. And the design organization, the design optimization, sorry, are much easier to incorporate when they don't risk extensive rework. If you've ever seen the, the graphic that's used for constructability, for example, um, it's a steep drop off curve about the impact of constructability over the project phases. If you do constructability during FEL2, it has a high impact. FEL3 is lower and it gets lower and lower. It drops off precipitously. AWP is much the same. If you can get the information in early, get a plan in place early during the FEL2 and into the start of FEL3, you've got a much better chance of actually doing something meaningful and it not causing massive churn for the engineers. Then as you get to the end of FEL2 and prepare to go through the stage gate process, we're gonna look at creating your master work packaging index, an AWP compliance schedule. And for those of you not familiar with me, I apologize, I do pronounce it schedule, English upbringing, um, and a project estimate. So for items like the schedule and the estimate, we're not talking about writing a user manual for P6. I'm not gonna teach you how to use P6, that's not the point. We're not talking about creating an estimating procedure. Typically, your companies will all have existing procedures for how to do an estimate, how to do a schedule. What we wanna cover is the ways that AWP impacts how the schedule and the estimate are set up. So you need to get early alignment between the deliverables. You need to get your naming convention sorted out. Make sure that everyone on the team knows the priorities in the sequence. And if you can do that during FEL, you're well on your way. So then we get into FEL3, uh, also known as feed, where we're going to refine the path of construction. So the one we created during FEL2 is not the final one, and we'll cover this in a bit more detail here shortly. Uh, we'll refine it during FEL3 with the additional information that we've received from the design progression. So AWP during this stage, again, mirrors the overall stage goals. It's all about optimization. The path of construction from FEL2 wasn't perfect. You didn't know everything. Like we said, you didn't have all the data, but it gave you a good starting point. So essentially what you're gonna do is go back and challenge all your assumptions, make sure all the stakeholders have a voice and finalize your plan by the end of the stage. So the engineers can meet your expectations during detailed design. The trick and the biggest importance with FEL3 with the path of construction is finalize it and lock it in. And after that, it needs to become much like design development and, and quantity changes. You shouldn't be doing that after FEL3 in any sort of meaningful way. You shouldn't be adding a piece of equipment to your design after FEL3. So you need to treat the path of construction with that same locked in rigor. We're gonna also look at updating the master index and consider what the data requirements are for the 3D model. So the model is gonna be an invaluable tool for AWP and particularly for workplace planning. But a bad model with limited or incorrect data can cause a huge amount of churn and rework downstream. To be honest with you, I've spent way too much time trying to stand up work packaging programs in the field using a model that's terrible with bad data. And you end up spending so much churn and fight with the engineers, typically three weeks before you're due to start construction. And you can't build your IWPs graphically because the information in the model just isn't there to support it. So getting it right from the beginning relies on making sure that the engineering contractor knows the expectations and can meet them. They can build whatever data into the model you need, you just have to tell them and then you have to monitor it and make sure it's actually happening. Then for the end of phase deliverables, we're gonna look at updating the estimate and the schedule down to the CWP level of detail. So again, it's just a further refinement 
more detail, more level of information. And then we're going to look at one of the big hot topics, which is contract language for AWP. I've seen many different approaches to including AWP in a contract for over the years. No, no two of them have ever been the same. Some organizations will, some, some will not even put it in there. Um, and just expect AWP to happen by osmosis. Some will put in two sentences, some will put in six, seven pages, some will put in an entire book right into the terms and conditions of the contract. So there's ways and means to do it, and what we'll present is what we feel is the most effective way of representing AWP in your contract. Then we get into detailed design. So plans have been made, priorities have been set, all the project stakeholders know what the installation sequence is and your schedule is going to keep running like clockwork so now during detailed design awp focus switches to monitoring engineering progress we're going to look at kpis key performance indicators for engineering to help you keep a close eye on the deliverables it's not a question of not trusting the engineers but it's the old adage about trust but verify so we're going to be looking at how do we know that engineering is actually going to make that deliverable on time and make the committed date that they talked about? We're going to have a look at what an EWP engineering work package should be, what it should contain, and in my opinion, equally importantly, what it shouldn't contain. We're going to look at what makes a good CWP or construction work package and what separates the construction work package from the engineering work package. We'll also look at who does what who makes the EWPs, who makes the CWPs. And we're gonna create the constraints we need to fully understand what has to be completed before an EWP or CWP can be released. This in detailed design is your last chance to get things right before the work transitions to the field. And typically we don't mean at the end of detailed design, we mean early because most projects part way through detailed design are already starting to move to the field. Any issues and problems cost far more to solve when they're discovered by an installation crew. Fixing issues upstream in engineering can feel like a chore, but compared to having 20 people standing around waiting for RFI permission to cut a spool that's clashing with a steel beam, it's much, much higher cost. It's much, much worse to have that amount of people inefficient in the field, and fixing it in engineering is much, much more efficient. So the last section we'll be looking at for the content and what we're proposing to talk about for the construction phase. Typically, I like to break this into three parts. What needs to be done before mobilization, because that's one that's not always focused on. Everybody's in this rush to get, to get construction personnel boots on the ground in the field. There are some things that you need to do before you mobilize. Um, and also mobilization takes on a slightly different angle with doing upfront planning. You don't mobilize 50 people to site day one. You need to get your workface planners for your early stage work involved in time enough that they can build IWPs, do their constraint management, and get meaningful work for a crew to do before the crew arrives on site. Second stage, what will be, uh, is going to be the part about the work packaging effort, as in building IWPs in the field, building test work packages, etc and then progressing and closing out the work packages in the field. So we're gonna discuss the contractor's workface planning plan, key performance indicators for workface planning, and how dashboards can be used to visually manage your work packaging efforts. Next, we're gonna cover the key topics of graphical and non-graphical work packaging for making IWPs. And for those of you not familiar with the terminology, by graphical, what we mean is taking a copy of the model uh, which we'll have upgraded to what we refer to as a virtual construction model, that data attributed engineering model with additional information built into it and literally dragging and dropping spools or bits of steel out of the model into a bucket saying, this is my IWP. So instead of doing everything off lists or, or trying to compile IWPs manually, we can literally use the model and drag those in and create graphical IWPs. And then non-graphical, is the more old school way, building things off lists, off tables, off charts, and doing things a lot more manually. Uh, we'll also look at the identification and management of IWP constraints. So what do I need to be resolved before this work can go to the field? And then lastly, we're gonna look at progress reporting, test work packages, and system turnover. 
then in a reflection of real life, we'll close out with lessons learned and continuous improvement, because unless you're continuously looking at, reviewing and adapting and, and developing your AWP plan and your AWP philosophy, you're not gonna get to that next level of maturity. Okay, so in, in today's workshop, we're gonna be focusing on setting up the project for AWP success. We're gonna be looking at the activities that we just walked through for FEL2 and FEL3. So let's see what a couple of these might look like. We're just gonna give you a, a fairly short preview today of two of the key topics that we're gonna be looking at in this second batch um, of releases that are gonna be coming in next year. So first of all, we're gonna look at a path of construction. Why do we need to develop a path of construction? Uh, construction nearly always starts too early. Everybody's in a rush to get the project moving. Everybody wants to get to the field. There may have been delays in engineering, but as soon as there's that first batch of drawings, quick, go to the field, start building stuff. Um, and then unfortunately, as we see far too often, we get out to the field and things grind to a halt because we, yes, we can do a first few weeks of work and then we run out because we haven't got the rest of the engineering behind us to continue effectively. So another reason construction efficiencies in the field continue to decline. And this is partly because of missing materials and engineering. We're not getting the amount of work done for the amount of investment or for the amount of hours that we should be. The sequence in which engineering issues information is rarely, if ever, the way the construction wants to build it. Engineering does things in the way that's most efficient for them. And quite honestly, who can blame them? That was what makes sense. They want to do it as best as they can for them. But part of the reason for the path of construction is for us as construction personnel um, and AWP people to be able to educate engineering on a project by project basis to say, here's how we want it. We want to build it from left to right. So don't give us the stuff on the right hand side first, give us the stuff on the left hand side first. Engineering progress is not aligned to deliverables that support construction progress. So this is another one of those weird ones where we know engineering is going to get us everything at some stage, but do we actually know what we're getting from engineering? Do we know you know, they can tell us we've done X amount of drawings, but are they the right drawings? Are they working on the things we need? And do we understand the impact of them saying we're 47% complete? Impacts associated with engineering delays are not well understood. Um, and my personal favorite, construction always has to still finish on time. So there's delays on the front end and engineering is late, either by impacts to them or impacts from them. And construction is still told essentially suck it up. Um, engineering deliverables are, and I think I'm being a little mean here by saying often incomplete, um, but certainly all too regularly it can happen that engineering deliverables can be incomplete and we tend to push resolution of it down to the lowest level. I mean, I've seen too many times notes on drawings contracted to verify or the engineering company or the owner telling the construction contractor to raise an RFI back to them to ask a question. Um, so all of this is because we're rushing to push information out and meet dates and we're pushing out incomplete information. And the last one and another big sort of area for focus for AWP, commissioning and startup priorities are rarely planned for, right? Construction is not the end of it. When construction finishes, when we get to mechanical completion, the, the facility doesn't switch on. There's still quite a bit of work to do to get it going. So we need to understand the transition from engineering to construction and from construction to CNSU, commissioning a startup. So I always like to think of path of construction as an iterative process. You can start looking at path of construction in FEL2 as soon as you've completed concept select and as soon as you know what the solution for the project is going to be. So this assumes, by the way, that you have had some constructability input into the concept select process. So typically, I mean, in FEL1, I've heard people talk about path of construction in FEL1. Well, in FEL1, you're supposed to be doing divergent thinking. You're supposed to be looking at here are the several different options that we can create, and we need one of them to be viable, but you don't figure out until FEL2 which one of those is the viable one. So you can have constructability input during FEL1 and the early stages of FEL2, 
but the path of construction effort really kicks in once you've done that concept select. So the first path of construction should be an idealized one, what I call the unconstrained path of construction. And by this, just construction in the room. No constraints, nothing holds you back. Just figure out what the best path is for construction. And this can sometimes be a really interesting process because I've seen a lot of times construction people get this sort of wide-eyed look when you sit them down and say, how do you want to build this? Because they're not used to being asked. Um, it's it's a very, very interesting process when you can say to a construction person who's used to dealing with being, you know, random stuff being thrown at them and having to sort of figure it out. Okay, how do you actually want to do this? So that's the first step. Then, and still during FEL2, start looking at your constraints. This is when it becomes critical to have the other stakeholders in the discussion. You can roll out the preferred path of construction and then have a reality check with engineering, with procurement, contracts, fabrication, modularization, commissioning, and startup. And just say to everybody, okay, let's shoot holes in this plan. Let's figure out what we don't like about it. And this is when the uh, procurement people get to say, the thing you want first is the longest lead item on the project. Okay. How are we going to do that? Are we going to be able to order it early enough? Can we get, you know, pre-funding to order that one piece of equipment? Engineering comes back and says, you know, we can't give you this foundation detail until we know the equipment weight from the vendor. So you have to start looking at all the different paths you need and all of the different things that are going to hold you up. Somebody's going to say, hey, we can't get our construction permit that early. So you're going to have a look at what we refer to as soft and hard constraints, where the soft ones are, these are the things that I can change sometimes with you know more effort by resequencing or sometimes with the liberal application of additional money and the hard constraints are the things you can't change so you're going to look at the things that i mean even with the best will in the world there's nothing you can do and the date is the date so you look at each constraint that's going to impact your ideal path of construction invite criticism let everybody present their input about what could impede the plan and then separate them into those soft and hard constraints. It becomes at that point something of a negotiation. So you want to try and stay as close as you can to the original path of construction whilst working around the hard constraints. And for the soft constraints, discuss what represents more value for the project overall. So for example, does paying a premium to have a piece of equipment early make sense for the project? You know, if you're going to have to pay an extra hundred thousand dollars for a, a premium cost to a, for a piece of equipment, and construction says, "Well, yeah, it'll save us time, but it's only going to save us a day," that's probably not worth it, right? Um, so you can look at it as value to the project, and critically, don't forget commissioning and startup. The project isn't done until it can be turned over and started up. So make sure that system completions play an active role in the discussion. Then during FEL three feed. Update your path of construction to reflect the latest project information and design development. So this just becomes that iterative process, that, that discussion again of, okay, here's the constrained path of construction from FEL2. Were we right? Were we wrong? What do we need to do to change it to make it better? Lastly, and most importantly, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, lock it in at the end of feed, at the end of FEL3. Don't keep changing your mind. Give the engineering and procurement teams a chance to deliver on the plan, if you keep changing your mind, it's not going to go anywhere and they're going to lose interest in trying to adhere to a path of construction that you're not sticking to. So avoid calls to change the path of construction. If something happens during detailed design, find ways to solve the problem without automatically pushing it down onto construction to solve. The, the, the immediate reaction is always, oh, this is, this is late or this is a problem. Right. Construction, what are you going to do about it? Uh, somebody brought this up at the AWP conference and I had an excellent example where it was just, you know, the, the immediate response was construction. What are you going to do? Well, why do we need to? You know, it's it's a problem upstream of ours. This was a procurement problem, for an example. What can you do to fix it before it becomes construction's problem? And in the end, they discovered that they just, they could accelerate the purchase order of those valves or piece of equipment or whatever it was, and it didn't become a construction problem. So use the path of construction as the sort of wall, as the bulwark to push everything up against and make sure that you're not changing it just for no reason. 
So what to consider in your path of construction? So these are just some of the topics and some of the things to look for. Constructability, how are we going to be able to build this thing? Um, what are the practicalities of assembling this? Uh, field hours, where's the greatest density of site work and hours? One of the things I love to do with these things is produce what I call a heat map. So you take your plot plan and your construction work areas, and depending on the number of hours in each construction work area, you have a grade of colors from sort of you know light to dark and the darkest the darkest areas are the ones with the heaviest hours and just putting that up on the wall you can suddenly think well hang on a sec we were going to leave that area to last but that's the way our, most of our working hours are so we better get to that sooner early access lowering the manpower peak and getting late trades in as soon as possible so by this what i'm talking about is something like e and i electrical contractors every project I've done has always been this sort of attitude of well we'll bring in the electricians when we need them and the problem is every project ends up becoming critical path through electrical and instrumentation at the end because you haven't made the efforts to bring them in soon enough so rather than sort of myopically focusing on mechanical and then let's bring E&I in when we can try to do what you can to get them a meaningful amount of work early so that you can reduce that manpower peak at the end and conversely, spread of work. Don't have everybody working in the same area at the same time. And that also goes to that field hours thing. You don't want to have 500 people working in a thousand square foot area at one time. It doesn't work. So look at your manpower densities. Look at how much stacking you're going to have, both in terms of different trades, but also in terms of the verticality. Are you planning to have people working above other people and dropping stuff on them and having welding sparks going everywhere? So look at how many people you're gonna have in each area. And then as we talked about commissioning and startup, what are the priorities for handover? We also have to consider those constraints that we were talking about, engineering deliverables, vendor information, material and equipment supply, modularization. I know it's happening more and more, especially on the larger projects, because we're trying to push as much work off site as possible. So, and that's not just modularization, fabrication and modularization, uh, and then permits. So path of construction, like we talked about, has diminishing impact over time. So do your initial POC when you still have, for example, the ability to influence the plot plan or the modularization strategy. Don't wait too long to have good ideas. And then you get into graphical representation. So a picture paints a thousand words and seeing your path of construction play back in sequence is a very powerful tool. So during the early stages, this might be something as simple as a diagram showing the priority sequence. I mean, this thing here on the left on the screen, a simple representation, but just from a few colored arrows on the screen, we can show a very simple representation of what our path of construction might be. And then you can do simple in-house things. You can take, for example, a copy of your plot plan and animate it, have blocks of stuff moving in and out to show the parts of your plot plan as they're being built. Uh, just show the major equipment and the large items being installed in sequence. Then once you've got a 3D model, invest in 4D playback to tie your model components to the schedule. Watch the plant being built in full 3D rendering. For larger complex projects, these tools will give you an immediate ability to visualize the sequence and correct any errors and for construction people that visual stuff is very very important that's the stuff where people really get a lot of value out of seeing the plan out of seeing what how it's going to be put together so then what do we do with the path of construction once we've built it it is the starting point for a lot of your awp deliverables the key alignment for the path of construction is the schedule it should be used to drive your engineering schedule, your procurement schedule, your fabrication and modularization sequence, and all of those should be tied in with the RAS dates, the required at site dates, and the delivery dates into the integrated master schedule. You're looking to ultimately support the construction sequence on site. It's also gonna influence your 3D model partitions and your takeoffs, which are gonna derive the quantities by construction work area and discipline used to support the estimate. The path of construction will impact your contracting plan, helping you to determine who does what and how to separate the work out between contractors. Then the secondary elements will link together. For example, the schedule will provide accurate durations, 
which will feed indirect costs for the estimate, and the estimate will feed accurate schedule durations by providing known quantities. Your estimate and execution plan will combine with your CWP breakdown to allow for bid verification of the hours per package. So given all of these uses and interdependencies, the path of construction is the single most important element of advanced work packaging. Okay, so the other topic we were going to look at today is a bit of a pre-read. It's a very sort of highlight overview of scheduling an AWP project. So one of the key aspects of scheduling an AWP project is the attempt to move away from old school methods that are still in regular use. So too often we cling to ideas that generate bad habits. How many times have you heard at 30% detailed design, we can mobilize construction and start civil work? We take arbitrary notions for 30, 60, 90 and use them as a basis for scheduling key activities in the field. Then what happens? We mobilize the site in a big panic, start working, and quickly run out of engineering drawings and materials. So we either have to slow down or stop. The change that we look to bring in with AWP is to schedule by work package and have clear and granular relationships between the work packages of the different contractors. Construction needs to know when each civil package will be ready, not just the first one. Engineering can still specify the activities that it needs to manage its work, but these should be treated as constraints on the release of the EWP. And then there should be a clear, distinct link from that EWP to the associated CWP, which will then mean that the IWPs that exist as the children of the CWPs can be planned. So the AWP approach to scheduling isn't about using a different piece of software or changing your company's policies. It's about making sure the schedule is structured and detailed enough to support the work package delivery. So a few useful tips for scheduling an AWP project. The first one I hope is obvious by now, given that what we've just been talking about, use the path of construction as the basis for the sequence. If you create a path of construction and your scheduler sits in a different room and builds a completely different schedule, it's not going to work for you. In terms of the detail, schedule to a CWP level in P6, in Primavera, or equivalent, whatever it is you're using. And that should be the integrated master schedule. So that should be down to the CWP, EWP level. Ensure that the interface points between engineering and construction are clear. A very, very big one typically. I mean, if you're doing an EPC contract and it's all that is in-house in one organization, it's still important, but it's less critical. But typically, if you're having a handoff from engineering to construction, we need to know when is engineering going to be done with this. Relationships. Uh, for those of you familiar with scheduling terminology, wherever possible, use finish to start relationships for interfaces. What we're trying to avoid is that old school habit of at 30%, we've got this long bar like we were looking at in the previous slide, and at 30%, we're going to take sort of a, a lag off that bar and move into something else. Fewest number of lags and, and links like that possible. Most of it should be this engineering work for this package is complete, finish to start, then construction can start. And another one that I've also seen missed too often, allow time for owner review and the creation of the CWPs and the IWPs. It does not immediately mean that the second you finish the engineering work package, you can start construction in the field. If we're doing this properly and if we're doing proper AWP, it then takes time to have somebody build a CWP from it, oftentimes an estimate done, you know, a schedule update based on the final numbers, and then somebody's got to build all those IWPs, and then they've got to do constraint management on them before you even start looking at striking an arc in the field. Okay, so that's just a couple of the sort of previews that we were going to look at, um, and that's the, some of the kind of information that we'll be sharing in the implementation toolkit. This was obviously just a high-level review of a couple of areas. Before we take anything further, uh, we're going to take a very quick look at the kind of AWP information that's already available in the industry today. The good news is we're not starting from scratch here. There's a lot of information already available about AWP. As I mentioned earlier, much of this effort is being championed by the Construction Industry Institute here in the US and COA, the Construction Owners Association of Alberta, up in Canada. 
O3 is an active member of CII with three of the current subcommittees being chaired by O3 personnel. So as a starting point, I wanted to show you what's already available to you if you're a CII member. CII has compiled a landing page for AWP information. Under resources, select AWP overview. From there, information and tools are organized into groups with discover, engage, and expand. So I'm not gonna read through all of these. I know we covered these in the last meeting, but in each section, there's various tools and, and pieces of data and reports and information that you can use as reference material for AWP. Things like the AWP Education Primer, great place to start for AWP 101. And that takes it all the way through once you get into expand into things like uh, supply chain and commissioning and startup. There's also other excellent sources for AWP information and training. Um, O3 is proud to be a partner of the Concord Academy as part of our extensive partner network. So for those of you looking to get some self-paced training for AWP and workplace planning, uh, there's a link there to the Concord Academy, as well as, like I mentioned, COA up in Canada and the Work Packaging AWP Institute. Okay, so back to the implementation toolkit. What are we doing here today? Why are we here? What are we talking about? We want your opinion. We want to know what gaps you see. We want to know what tools and information you need to make a case for AWP within your organization. We want to know what you can't find, what you don't understand, and what you need direction in. We know that we don't know everything. You're all at different parts of your journey, and you have all had different experiences of AWP to date. So we want to understand the pain points because chances are, if you're experiencing them, so are other people. It would be too much to cover in one session, so we're breaking it up into three parts. So last month, we looked at what you need to get started with AWP. Today, we're looking at those early planning stages, FEL2 and FEL3, and how to get set up for AWP success. Then we're going to be looking at a third session where we're going to cover the detailed design and construction phases, and that's going to be in January of next year. At each workshop, we want your opinion on what you need. Tell us the gaps you see, and we'll use the AWP toolkit to help cover them. So a quick recap. So today we're looking at FEL2 and FEL3. So what you see on the screen is what we're planning to include in the toolkit. This is the stuff we're going to give you. We're going to cover how to create CWAs, path of construction, work breakdown structure, AWP plan, master index, schedule an estimate during FEL2, and then for FEL3, refining that path of construction, the EWP and CWP master index development, 3D model, data requirements, estimate, schedule, again, and contract language. So in order to get your input, we've created a mural page. It's entirely web-based, so you don't need to install anything. Just type this easy link into your web browser and open the mural screen. Remember to leave your GoToMeeting open so you can hear the instructions. So click on the link and it should bring you to our mural page. And there's also a copy of that link posted in the chat function. You'll also see it for those of you not able to link directly to mural, you'll be able to see it on my screen here. So there's several parts to this. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit here. So there's a few parts to this, and what we want to do is we're going to get started with who you guys are. So we're going to ask everybody to create a, a tab, a, a sticky note. Basically, this is, for those of you not familiar, this is a digital whiteboard. Um, so we want people in there creating stickers in this top section to tell us who you are. So for those of you who've used this before, on the left-hand side, up here, there's this little representation of a sticky note. You can grab a sticky note. And then unfortunately, when it puts it into the screen, it always puts it really small. So you can just expand it and then type in there and tell us the name, your name and the company that you work for and put it in the correct box as to whether you are an owner, an EPC, engineering, construction contractor, or partner, vendor, consultant. So we'll take a few minutes to do that. And while you're working on that, also a good time for a quick bio break. Um, so everybody try and get your names in. If you if you can't get the stickers to work, I think you can also just literally double click on the screen and you'll get a sticker and then just resize it so you can see um, so you can see it and it's big enough to type into it. 
if you don't, if you're not able to do that, you can just copy paste one of the ones I've just created there. Andrew, <clears throat> we've got a couple questions that came in, so I think this might be a good time to address some of those while people are getting their stickies placed. Fantastic. Uh, so first one, uh, why is it important to identify KPIs and dashboards before mobilization? For construction phase, um, because it's a question of setting the tone, it's a question of setting the standard. Um, you want to know what it is you want to be measuring before you ha start having to measure it. The owner, it typically goes to the owner construction contractor relationship. So the owner is going to specify most of the time, if it's set up properly, the owner is going to specify the KPIs. They're going to say, for example, we expect 30 days of backlog for all trades. And disciplines um, they're going to stipulate what those are and like with everything else the best place to do that is by including it in the documentation in the contract so that everybody's on the same page as to what needs to be done so if that's in place before you mobilize it's essentially gives the contractor fair warning of these are the things that we're going to be looking for these are the things that we're going to consider um, and we're going to be measuring you on so as the construction contractor, I want to know what's the owner going to be measuring measuring me on as a vendor, um, or sorry, as a vendor, as a contractor. I'm reading the screen at the same time as I'm answering the question. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. If there's a follow up, feel free to drop that into the uh, into the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, one other question: What do you recommend doing with the lessons learned you capture? Uh, um, lessons learned are always a quirky thing on any project, any anything. Um, lessons learned are an amazing waste of time if you sit down, write them all down, and then forget about them. So the lessons learned need to be rolled back into your process. I mean, AWP, so from an AWP specific standpoint, it's a question of understanding what went well and what went badly for you. The, the beauty of AWP is there is no like absolute set defined specific requirement. To give you an example, the, 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 the standard within the industry for IWPs, they should be between 500 and 1,000 hours because that was the methodology that came out of Canada when it was first invented based on a 10-day working shift. For a single crew, that represented between 500 and 1,000 hours. Well, and there's a lot of companies now who are employing this and saying, well, hang on, you know, maybe for one massive cable pull, we might have an IWP that's 1,200 hours. So we can't stick to that. Or for, for smaller work, we might have IWPs that are two or 300. And I've seen companies and contractors who will stipulate your IWPs must be between 500 and 1,000 hours. And then they find that creates an unnecessary block and an unnecessary sort of wall that you can't go up past. So the lesson learned there is that they can soften it to say our operating standard is that they should be typically between 500 and 1,000 hours, but by exception, they can be greater than that or smaller than that, especially on the smaller end. Uh, you don't want to have lots of you know, 2,000, 3,000 hour IWPs as a standard. But so the lesson learned there is, is to, this is where I'm talking about adapting your process, adapting your procedure, so you can figure out what works for you as a company. And frankly, if I'm an owner and a contractor comes to me and says, we've got our AWP process, but instead of 500 to 1,000, we use an average of 400 hours for our IWP. Fantastic. I'm not going to argue with you. That's great. You've clearly done some work and figured out what works for you. So that's where some of the lessons learned come in. Okay, and then uh, who should be involved in developing the path of construction? Everybody. Um, like I said, the first version I always like to do, and I know there's this, there's a big push. That the answer you'll get from just about everywhere in the AWP industry is, is everybody. Um, I always prefer to start with just construction first because you get there's a lot of noise when you try and do it with everybody right from the off. So whereas if you can get a sort of a, a more pure version of it just by having construction people in the room. I, I mean, I've done path of construction for multi-billion dollar projects with three or four construction people in the room. And then you expand it. Then you say, right, here's our, here's our start point. Here's our logic. Here's what we want. 
and then you start getting the the engineering people in the, the procurement people in the room and it doesn't need to be an army of 500 people but you want to get the people in the room who have the right ideas so you know for example you're going to bring your engineering manager into the room but the engineering manager isn't going to know all of the details of all the key disciplines so you might be bringing in each discipline lead you're going to have your procurement people in the room now for smaller jobs that might be one person for larger jobs there might be two or three people who are responsible for different aspects of mechanical electrical different types of purchasing uh, commissioning and startup get your operations people in get the people who are actually going to commission it get them in the room start asking questions i mean it's typically during especially during fel2 they haven't got enough information to really start having a good idea of how they want to finalize the the commissioning plan but they also have a fairly good idea of what they don't want so getting those people in the room contracts people um definitely if you're going to start talking about how we're going to break the work up how we're going to award if you're going to break it up to different contractors you want to make sure that your ideas of how it's going to be broken up and segmented um works for your contracting strategy um, and then essentially it also depends who's in charge of it it should be owner led it should be owner driven especially in those contracts where um, the ep or the engineering contractor works for the owner and the construction contractor separately works for the owner um, having the owner driving the process is going to be the important part because they're the ones sitting in the middle of all of this and they're the ones who might have to sort of referee discussions um between the different contractors okay and then uh just two more questions here what is an awp master index it's the list of all the packages um so it's it's your ewps it's your cwps it's understanding um essentially what's going to be coming down the uh down the pipe at you for your project so you start off with an understanding of let's take a simple example i mean any the basic sort of structure for any of these packages is area and discipline so for each area you've got each discipline and you're going to have each one of those then at a very simplistic level is going to create an ewp so pipe in area one steel in area three etc cetera, etc cetera. so that that matrix is going to give you here's all of my ewps and then you're going to take that and map that to your CWPs, which is typically done on a one-to-one -one basis, but sometimes with exceptions. And then from there, those CWPs get broken down into the IWPs. Um, so this this master index is essentially the the log, the, the the digital data of all of those different packages, and critically how they're linked together. So, you know, in the old days, we would do this with Excel. And nowadays, we're finding a lot more structure by doing this with with um, a proper database tool that can include those links and, uh, and relationships between the packages. All right. And then last one here. Uh, how long does it take to define the path of construction, generally for middle to large projects uh, with different areas? Really, uh, I don't know if you mean in terms of time or hours or days or weeks, but uh, I mean, it's, it is an iterative process. Uh, to give you a simple example, the last project I was doing this on was a multi-billion dollar project on the Gulf Coast, and we ended up at the end of FEL 3 um, with revision 10 of our path of construction because we kept throughout FEL 3, FEL 2 and FEL 3 getting smarter and smarter about the way to do it, and we kept refining it and making it better and better. So it's it's not a, you know, you're going to sit in the room for three hours, type it up and put it on a shelf and it's done exercise. It shouldn't be. For some smaller projects where there isn't much nuance to it, you might have one meeting in FEL2 and one meeting in FEL3 and there isn't much refinement. But for a large project, if you're talking sort of, a, you know, a few hundred million to a billion dollar project, you should be having multiple meetings. You start off with a, an interactive plant project planning session. Um, after you've done the initial construction pass, get everybody in the room, and then you keep revisiting it. You keep coming back to it during FEL3 as you're developing and finalizing that CWP level schedule. So it's not a, I, I can't sit here and say it's a 10 hour activity. It is massive. Uh, it is, if it's done properly, it's a big part of what you're trying to do and it'll influence a heck of a lot. So uh, we, like I said, when we were working 
uh, on that last project, we were working with our engineering and procurement contractor, and we had several meetings about it. We had several discussions about it. We went away and made sort of presentations and sort of animations of it and kept coming back and reviewing it. Spend whatever time you have to to make it right and get, get it right during FEL3. Okay, so that was it for the questions, Tara. Yeah, you can uh, take back over and let me know if you need me to un for feedback. Okay. So we've got people here, we've got owner representation, EPC, construction contractor, and partners, vendors, consultants. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us and especially for jumping into this mural session. So the point of this now is to give you guys an opportunity to tell us what else. So during FEL2 and FEL3, during this setting up for success window, these uh, eight boxes during FEL2 and the six boxes during FEL3 that's already listed there, this is what we're planning to tell you. This is the stuff we're planning to include in the AWP toolkit. So what else do you need to know? What else is a problem for you during FEL2, 3? What else have we not included? What else would you like to see? So this can be um, anything from, you know, how do I code procurement packages? Um, you know, how do I get commissioning and startup involved? How do I do what well, we've talked about? Things like contract language. What we want to know is what else do you want to see? So this is your chance to influence what we include as content. So, so uh, sorry, somebody's already taking stealing work breakdown structure. Um, so same sort of deal. Just grab a sticky note and put it into these boxes below. So leave the part one here. Leave those ones on the um, at the top section, and then pull new ones or put new ideas in here. Double click, same as before. Expand and say, you know, we want to see something. So. Tell us your ideas. Uh, we're going to give you sort of 10 minutes or so to get some ideas in place. What's been a problem for you? What's been an issue for you? What are you struggling with internally in your organization? Um, and we're already starting to see some information coming in. So we'll give you guys 10 minutes, get some ideas in place. Like I said, if anyone needs to step away, grab a coffee, go for it. Yes, brilliant. Please resize it so we can all read it. That's excellent. Um, and once we've got those, we'll take a run through them and we'll do a quick voting session so we can all see which ideas we're interested in adding to the process. So I'm gonna go on mute for a few minutes, let everybody have a chance to, to uh, get our head and start putting some stickies in without me whittering in your ear the whole time.
Okay, folks, we'll give you another few minutes to get your questions in. Is there anything that's bugging you or the, anything more that you want included? The FEL2, FEL3 stages. Now's the time to ask and we can make sure we address it when we release the information to you. And if anyone's got any questions while we're doing this, uh, Tori has unmuted everybody from our end. So if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself on your version of GoToMeeting and ask any questions directly if that would help. Okay. Anybody got any questions? If not, I'll start going through some of the murals that we got. Okay. Well, if anyone's got any questions, even while I'm talking, feel free to put them in the chat window and Tori can catch them up with me once we're done going through these. Okay. So let's have a look at what we want to see. So for FEL2, Vendor required data. What do you want to see from us and what do you need in your modeling environment? Yeah, yeah, very difficult one. I know that there's been a lot of work done on um, data requirements in general within the AWP industry. Um, and certainly O3 has a, has a very detailed data spec um, as to what is needed to support uh, modeling and graphical work packaging in the field. Um, and I know it's always, a very difficult one for vendors because they tend to get involved way too late in the process and suddenly get told here's what we need so the critical aspect i think as well as that is just what do we need but also you know tell us early i think uh, so thank you for that one who should be involved in path construction creation so yeah absolutely we'll definitely put some detail in that when we're talking about the path of construction how often should the path of construction be updated uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. We'll uh, we'll make sure we cover that when we're doing a section about path construction. I'm going to pull this one out a little bit so I can get to the text. There we go. Level of effort and time commitment of construction personnel to establish CWA, POC, etc. This is one of our challenges in getting construction input at the select phase. Yeah, and that unfortunately goes back to owner um the the owner requirement to recognize that in order to get viable and valuable construction input especially during the select phase you have to have the right people in the room um it also goes to and this is a good reminder for me one of the things i'll make sure to address is um it's a question of what do we do if the construction contractor isn't present for example um it, typically the construction contractor is done as a 
there's a bid and award just before the construction phase and then they end up sort of being handed this path of construction um, and so it becomes okay well if the construction contractor isn't going to be in place who should be um, personally I've got four ways that I like to look at this um, varying degrees of success the, the best success you can have is to get the construction contractor who's going to execute the work involved in building the path of construction that's the best one uh, it's not always possible in fact it's very rarely possible unless you've got embedded contractors but that's definitely option one option two uh, look at your list of potential contractors and hire one of them to come in and do the work um, to help you plan the path of construction even if you're then going to go out to bid so you can write it into their contract to say this is just a services contract for you to give us input to the path of construction it does not guarantee you in any way that you're going to win the work you can still competitively tender the bid but you get the right kind of input from construction professionals who are actually potentially going to execute the work so that would be sort of option two option three owner personnel with construction experience so get a construction contractor uh, sorry get owner construction representation uh, and i've been in this role in the past and we as the owner established the path of construction because we didn't have the construction contractors uh, so it was me working with the other owner construction team members to build the path of construction so that's kind of option three but you still end up pushing that onto the construction contractor and then the other option would be the last option and probably the lowest option is rely on the engineer to do it um, and unfortunately that's the lowest option because again the engineering contractor by their nature is obviously going to try and do things in the most efficient way for engineering and their focus may not always be on creating the most efficient path of construction and i don't mean that as disrespect it's just the nature of the kind of work that they're going to do um, so it's definitely easier to have that um, done by somebody else so don't always rely on the engineering contractor to generate your path of construction but yes thank you for that good question define turnover packages or not um, well and that's a difficult one during FEL2 especially um, because there's going to be a lot of difficulty with knowing exactly what we're going to try to do um, especially for for projects that are early in the design phase um, as to when turnover packages can be identified prioritized sequenced etc what's the best way to involve procurement yeah absolutely it's an easy thing to say and it's not always an easy thing to do how many hours should be in each area so in each construction work area how many hours and again that's that's something we'll can talk about as one of the considerations when we're doing how to build construction work areas um, but yes it's uh it's a very difficult thing to to understand because it's not a question of every area is going to have ten thousand hours it's always going to be a lot more sort of up and down from there and it's obviously going to depend on the project size but yes thank you we'll make sure we include that in the cwa conversation how early should i start collecting data from fabricators or vendors and i love the idea that you put that in the fel2 box um that's that's uh, very ambitious um as early as possible is the obvious answer but yes that uh, we can take a look at some more details around that why are contractors typically not involved early yeah um again it's it's a contractual mindset everybody thinks to this day that the best value of, is competitive tender and it's taking a lot of time to get out of that um so we can look at some of the details around that when we're talking about path of construction but it goes back to what i was saying best case scenario you get the contractor in second best scenario you get a, a contractor in um, and then sort of working down from there um, but ultimately very few owners want to commit want to commit to a construction contractor until they've had a decent bid um, how does the POC align with the schedule yeah absolutely we'll definitely look to cover that in both the uh, POC but mostly in the construction schedule section how large should CWAs be presumably geographically um, so yeah that we can cover off during the uh, how to choose your construction work areas and then somebody's testing my eyesight during the first phase we need to have engineering mobe of construction commissioning man hours in engineering phase will increase in the first phase we need to have engineering mob of 
mobilization of construction commissioning and manners in engineering phase will increase. Not quite sure I'm following that last one in terms of the detail. Um, if you can spell it out or even unmute yourself and explain it, that would be great. Whatever makes more sense for you. Uh, looking at the FEL3, how long does it take to make the master index? Uh, resolving conflicts in path of construction priorities. Yes, that negotiation that I was talking about earlier. What are the best practices when creating a master index? Oh, wow, somebody's gone straight for the big one. How much will it cost? Uh, so uh, one of the things that we are releasing as a deliverable today is return on investment which looks at the cost of AWP and the benefits. So hopefully for the person who we put there, how much will it cost? That will be included in that. Um, AWP for fabrication and modularization, um, always going to be an issue, not as straightforward. Sometimes it is just to sort of use the same methodology as you do for the construction site. How detailed should the schedule be at the end of FEL3? Yeah. Um, that's essentially the answer to that is it's going to be at a CWP level, but uh, thank you for that question. We'll put some more detail into the uh, into the uh, schedule section, and then we've got another fairly small type one here. Let's see if I can expand that so I can read it. If owner personnel developing POC, what type of assurance activities, i.e. acceptance process, are completed by contractors to then own the plan and schedule developed? Yeah, that transition is a very big one. And that's actually one of the ones that we'll get into as part of that pre-mobilization when we're talking sort of detailed design and construction phase, pre-construction phase. So that wouldn't be an FEL3 thing, but it's definitely one that we'll carry over to that next session um, because forcing a path of construction onto a contractor is a very, uh, I won't say difficult thing, but it takes some nuance to get it to work. So yeah, excellent question. Why are engineers reluctant to use the model as the source of, of truth for construction and later operations? Um, yeah, good question. Um, mostly boils down to the engineering model for them has always been an engineering model. Um, and it's a fairly recent change on our part that we were trying to use that engineering model for anything other than engineering. So it's a bit of a a step change for them in terms of what the actual application is. And then how to handle with subcontractor AWP approach, considering that some subcontractors are not have the knowledge how to bring AWP approach on subcontractor and have access to data without taking risk and subcontractor responsibility. Excellent. Okay. Uh, yes, that trickle down. How do you trickle down? Because, you know, certainly from a contractual standpoint, we're normally talking about the contractual relationship between the owner and the engineer, the owner and the construction contractor. Uh, so the subcontractor is another layer of trickle down for sure. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for those. Lots of good questions. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a voting session and everybody gets a chance to have a vote. Uh, so we're just going to call it ideas. Everybody gets two votes. Um, and we're just going to say that all we can vote on is the sticky notes. So to start the votes, uh, I'll start the voting session. Essentially what you're going to do is click a vote, uh, click on a card to add your vote. You can also shift click to remove it if you get, uh, if you get it wrong. Um, and once we've got the votes in, we can see which of these topics resonates most with everybody. So please pick the two cards that make the most uh, resonance with you. Pick the two cards that are going to be most important to you. And we'll see which of these need to be things that we definitely include in the process. Um, so I'm going to pick two myself. Let's have a look. Okay, so everybody pick the two that, uh, that are most important to them and then we'll see the results and then see where we go from here. Sorry, in the meantime, while we're voting, have any other questions come in on GoToMeeting? 
Uh, let me check here. If not, everybody on the phone will have one more uh, chance for questions at the end. So if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to drop them into the GoToMeeting chat function and we can cover those at the end. So it looks like we've got three people still voting. So if those three people are still going, um, please uh, get your votes in now. I think... Okay, we'll give everybody one more minute and then I'm going to end the voting session and we'll see. Okay, so we're good. So if anyone has any other questions, drop them in the chat and we can cover those at the end. And everybody's got 30 seconds left. Final chance to add a vote and then we'll take a look at the results. Okay. We're going to close out the voting session. And top votes, here we go. Why are contractors typically not involved early? Yeah, absolutely, big one. Why are engineers reluctant to use the model as the source of truth for construction and operations? The handling of subcontractors, the time commitment of construction personnel to develop the POC, and how detailed should the schedule be at the end of FEL3? So those are our top votes and the rest will have a bunch of singles. So these are the things that we will obviously mean a lot to people right now. We'll definitely make sure that we include uh, when we are going through and producing the details of this. So everybody, thank you very much for participating in the mural session. I'm gonna shut this down now and we'll get back to the presentation. Okay, so next steps. Uh, firstly, please join us in workshop three where we're gonna cover the execute stage. We're gonna look at executing AWP and that's gonna be detailed design and construction. And we're gonna take that all the way up to commissioning and completions. So we've got to save the date right now for that, Thursday, January 13th, 2022. Uh, Tori is going to be sending out links to all the registrants and it's going to be shared on LinkedIn so you can register for, um, also through our AWP implementation toolkit website. So join us for that third and final session and then and you'll start to see the, the results being published every month over the next little while. And as promised, the first three deliverables are now available. These cover learning about AWP building a business case, an ROI, which is return on investment, and how to select a pilot project. So please visit our website to download them. And there's a link there at the bottom of the screen, O3 Solutions, and it's follow that link and you'll be able to download. Each one of them comes as a little zip file and it contains the written document, which explains what, uh, what we developed and what the details of that are. And then in the case of the second one and the third one, you'll have, for example, an actual PowerPoint presentation that you can use and modify to your own organization. Um, and then the building, the uh, selecting the, the pilot project comes a little flow chart there for how to select the right project uh, to kick off as your pilot. So those first three are released and then we'll have more information as we go, as more of these become available. And with that, I will hand it back to Tori. So thank you all very much for listening. All right. Thank you, Andrew, for that highly informative and engaging presentation. Hope everybody had a lot to take away and enjoyed their uh, interaction with the mural. Um, so just a reminder of some other ways that you can uh, catch up and learn more from O3. Our website has many resources for you, um, all free and available at any time you want. Um, you'll find a wealth of AWP resources. Uh, we've got blogs um, that we try to post at least once a week. We've got tons of case studies that are all free to download too. 
Um, and then you can catch up on any of our past webinars. And if you missed the first session, that's on there too. And we have tons of explainer videos um, that are a variety of topics from AWP and other things within the industrial construction industry. So just some things to check out and then just never miss an update by just uh, registering for our newsletter. Um, we send it out around the first of every month. And that's all at our website at www.03.solutions. And also just a reminder, check out in the chat of GoToWebinar, uh, the link to the implementation toolkit is in there. Um, and that is where you'll find all of those available materials uh, that Andrew discussed today. And if you still have any further questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at o3.solutions, or again, you can find us on our website. There's a variety of ways to contact us through there as well. Um, and we hope you enjoyed today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And again, we will be emailing out the presentation recording and slides. And I will also provide a link to register for the, the third part and final session for AWP Exchange Implementation Toolkit. And that will be in January. So be on the lookout for that. And thanks again for joining us. And hope you have a good rest of your day.